Welcome and good evening. Um, my name is Chuck Matthews, and together with my colleague Paul Jones, uh, we are the directors of the Luce Project on Religion and its Publics at the University of Virginia across the street. Uh, together with our team, uh, we welcome you to this event, uh, Faith in the Struggle. I wanted to thank the rector and staff of St. Paul Memorial Church for letting us use their space for this event. Though this event is not sponsored by St. Paul's in any way, it seemed to us altogether fitting and proper that we gather here again, where so many were, at the beginning of the events of August 11th and 12th. We hope this event will help all of us grapple further with the evils that were so vividly on display that night just across the street and the next day in the rest of our town. We're very grateful to have you here this evening. Your presence here indicates your interest in respectful, searching, and inclusive discourse. Perhaps you won't agree with everything you hear this evening, but we ask that in the interest of a free and open exchange of ideas, you please refrain from making contributions that are solely disruptive. Intentionally inflammatory disruptions and disrespect interfere with everyone's safety and will prevent us from hearing all viewpoints. Anyone who disrupts the program will be asked to leave. And now, let me introduce the moderator of tonight's session, Professor John Mason of the Corcoran Department of History at the University of Virginia. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Um, I have the easy job tonight. My job is to introduce the speakers and to prompt them with a few questions and um, let them carry the ball. And I think the way that it's going to work is that I'm going to invite each of our panelists to say anything they'd like to at the beginning. Take three or four minutes, whatever happens to be on your mind tonight in this gathering. And um, after that, I've got a few questions that I would ask of each of you, and I'm really going to encourage you to have a conversation amongst yourself. So I might direct a question at Dr. Bellamy, but all of you could be feel free to, to chime in. And then once we've done a round like that, I'm certainly going to open it up because I know that you all have, will have um, questions and comments for our panel. So I'm probably like a lot of you, this is the first time I've been in the church since August 11th. Um, I, can't, I used to come to St. Paul's a lot, and I'm really pleased and happy to be here, and I want to thank Chuck for asking me to moderate this. Um, when my mother was more mobile, this was her church, and I accompanied her to this church on a fairly regular basis. But August 11th is my last memory of this church until now. There have been a lot of similar events, thinking about the events of August 11th and August 12th. I've done six or seven since the beginning of the semester at UVA, where I have either spoken or, or moderated a discussion. And all of those conversations have been about what happened and why did it happen it's been hard to sort of shift gears into where do we go from here? What do we do now? And I like the way that this evening is framed because it's framed both in terms of faith and in terms of where do we go from here? So please, let me introduce um, our panelists. And um, like I said, I'm gonna give them an opportunity to say a few words and then I've got a few questions. I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order, and our first is Dr. Wes Bellamy, who probably literally needs no introduction, but I am going to tell you that he's the vice mayor of the city of Charlottesville and was the youngest person ever elected to Charlottesville City Council. He's originally from Atlanta, but has very much made Charlottesville his home. Uh, he earned a master's degree in education administration in 2014 and his doctoral degree in 2017. Dr. Bellamy's primary focus as a city leader is on improving the lives of those who lack resources and to provide positive role models, um, especially for youth. The Reverend Brenda Brown Grooms.
is co-pastor of New Beginnings Christian Community. Um, Reverend Brown Grooms has a BA from UVA and a uh, Master's in Divinity from Union Theological Seminary. She served in churches in New York and Virginia and has worked as an assistant professor of New Testament Greek at American Baptist College and as a visiting professor and consultant at Virginia Seminary and College. She believes very strongly in the work of the church to create, mirror, and to maintain community. Reverend Brown Grooms also develops and facilitates workshops on various aspects of church life, Christian development, and personal empowerment. Dr. Larisha Hawkins. Um, is a lecturer in politics at UVA and was recently the Abed el Khadr Visiting Faculty Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture. Previously, she founded and directed the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Wheaton College, which I'm happy to say was founded by abolitionists, where she, was, uh, where she served for eight years as an associate professor of political science. Dr. Hawkins has her undergraduate degree from Rice University and her MA and PhD from the University of Oklahoma. She is animated by a conviction that political science should be relevant to the real world. Her research engages intersections of race and ethnicity, religion, and politics. Professor Jelaine Schmidt. is an associate professor in the Department of Religious Studies at UVA and a Black Lives Matter activist. She has a master's degree in divinity, an MA, and a PhD from Harvard, and has been at UVA since 2007. Her research and teaching are focused on the African diaspora and African diaspora religion of the Caribbean and Latin America, particularly festivities and rituals. She teaches courses which consider the effects of colonization and the slave trade upon the religious practices of the Americas. And the Reverend Seth Wispelway <laughs> is the brother of my favorite former student. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite former <laughs> students. Uh, a grassroots organizer, educator, nonprofit consultant, and pastor. Uh, he is the Directing Minister at Restoration Village Arts, a retreat and learning and action community for artists and ministers who are creating resources within today's movements of liberation. He's ordained in the United Church of Christ, holds bachelor's degrees from UVA, and a master's in pastoral ministry from Boston College. So, I think We'll simply go around the table, starting with Seth, and if you'd like to say a few words, um, take the time. Thank you. It's obviously a gift and a privilege to be up here with several of my barometers, personally and professionally, for whether I'm showing up and I think representing uh, my citizenship and faith in ways that I hope honors the living God. I hope it's, well, the white guy's talking first. I don't know if that's okay. Because <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> then you guys can correct as we go down the line. I used to be allergic to the word orthodoxy. I grew up in a faith tradition that defined faith and creeds and dotted lines and grace was cheaply abundant and so spent a good bit of my adulthood such as it is deconstructing a lot of that before well, getting ordained and giving up that I was going to become a professional Christian. Um, but my dear friend Reverend Osaji Fuseku turned orthodoxy into life again for me this summer. And he defines it this way for us who identify as Christians. We say that God, the God conscience, entered humanity in the body of an unwed teenage mother to an unimportant people in an unimportant part of the world living under occupation. And then that person, Jesus, 
defeated the empire. And we call that defeat Easter. And Jesus was executed in an act of state-sanctioned violence for living in such a way that the empire and the religious powers that be could not tolerate. Jesus made relationship and made a way for those who were considered untouchable, those on the margins, those who the state said their lives don't matter as much. And we call the end result of living with that heart and life and saying, hey, turn towards this life-giving way that says, you who say we're all made in the image of God, like, let's live as if that's true, and that's Easter. That's orthodoxy, as Reverend Seiko would say, I'm not querying the text. And so for those who claim an encounter with the living God, and many people in America do, many white people do, what does it mean to be sent to live in the way of Jesus in a country whose true national religion, we say we're a Christian nation, and I'll get to that in a second, but whose true national religions are some hodgepodge of militarism, consumer capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. You can catch all four usually pancaked on top of each other every Sunday afternoon. Mm. And to be sent, we're not forced to walk in the way of Jesus. It, you know, our popular imagination would have it that God could, she could give us a Holy Spirit kick to the rear, and that would be that. We don't have a choice. But we're also not casually invited. It's not like, hey, Moses, if you're not busy on Friday, would you mind going and free my people? Because that would be an easy out. You'd be like, yeah, I got a thing to do. Um, hey, if you're not busy August 12th, would you mind going and standing and confronting violent white supremacists who are surfacing an acute pastoral concern in our community. A lot of people said, yeah, I'm sorry, I've got a thing to do. And from Moses to the prophets, Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has sent me to bring liberty to the captive, good news to the poor, comfort to those who mourn. God sent Moses once the living God made God's urgent concerns known that people were oppressed. And what does Jesus turn to when Luke narrates the start of Jesus' public ministry? Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the oppressed, liberty to the captive, sight to the blind, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, but then does the mic drop when everyone's kind of staring at him awkwardly says, oh, by the way, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so for those of us who claim a going steady relationship with Jesus or are even curious about or compelled by this person, this God conscience, walking, living, breathing, and claim to be sent, we're not forced, we're not casually invited, then the national religions of the United States have to be confronted. And the American church is already, especially the white American church, is already starting from behind. You've got 400 years of catch up to do anyway, but when you give tax exempt status out and you call it a Christian nation, it's that much harder to root around and find what's at stake and how to make some stakes, I think. It involves having hard conversations, and I believe, speaking as a cis white man, uh, two fellow cis white men, and especially fellow cis white male pastors, bodily risk. Not necessarily in urgent situations, like we encountered on August 12th, because I dearly hope those circumstances don't arise again, but paying down the equity and opening our doors in ways that is going to drive the state crazy to the point of violence. Saying Black Lives Matter means living it with gospel specificity, 
just as we say, Jesus' love is for all, this Jesus who's at the margins, when we live in a country that says too many of these lives don't matter, Jesus is marching in the streets of St. Louis right now. Jesus has something to say about our city's zoning laws and decisions and investments. And I've gone well over four minutes. Thanks for having me. <laughs> he is a preacher. <laughs> So I'm not going to take four minutes. I, I didn't know that we have four. All right, thank you. No, I won't. Uh, politicians talk too much as it is. Uh, I want to say thank you all for having us. Um, I'd like to give honor to God and glory to God for having me here. Uh, and also, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my lovely wife, Ashley, hey honey, um, for coming and supporting me. Uh, I don't know if people quite understand the weight that my wife has to bear through all of this and she's a trooper through and through and I love her for that and even when I am the most difficult of difficult people she still loves me in spite of all of that and she's appreciated so I want you to make sure you always know that as well as my two daughters um, and I feel like I'm kind of at a family reunion of sorts I see uh, my Aunt Jane in the front I see my brother Bob the military man uh, I see scale. It's like my auntie slash cousin. I see Lloyd over there. I see my brother Seth right here. A lady who probably gave the one of the top five sermons that I've ever heard at my Aunt Holly's um, going home sermon. Who She woke up a lot of people and coined the term that we live in a beautiful, ugly city. I see a mentor of mine, Dean Adams, who's always been on me and very hard, but also giving a lot of love at all times, and I'm sitting up here also with my, my sister who holds me accountable, will call me on the carpet, will send me a 10-page text at 6 a.m. Uh, I'm not going to point any elbows and say who it is, but <laughs> it's not her. Um, so, you know, I, I feel really, really blessed to be here, and I'm looking forward to us having a very real conversation and for that, I'm not going to take too much of your time. Good evening. I'm glad to be here. We're doing something that I hold to be very important for the human race, and that's attempting to form the framework for a conversation. Um, three vignettes, if you will. I'm from a tradition that call, believes in calling. When I was three or four, um, I didn't realize that my conversations with God were strange, because they were my conversations. I always felt God to be near. And I've always been a church mouse. The, the next time I went to Sunday school, we were hearing the story of, of uh, Samuel. And so I said, oh. so God wants me to do something. So the next time I felt God near, I said, okay, so what do you want? It can't be that you want me to be a preacher because I'm a little girl and I'll grow up to be a woman. And I know I can't do that because I've never seen it. And so I put that thought on the shelf. And by the time I was eight, I had decided that the best way I could serve humanity and black people was to be a lawyer. I figured that I could serve people that way, and for some reason, I don't know, I didn't have the words for it. I thought it would help me not to become senile in old age. I don't know where, <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but I was convinced of it. And um, I did debate in junior high and high and in some college, and I like to talk. I really like talking, but I was a bit non plus by the fact that I had a set of uh, evidence cards for the issue and against the issue. And I'm saying to myself, well, either it's true or it's not. But I knew Burke, I've, I've been well trained. I knew how to argue for the issue using my plus cards and I knew how to argue against the issue using my negative cards. But it, 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 it bothered me, it bothered me because if I'm your lawyer, Lloyd, 
and I wanted to be a defense lawyer. I wanted to, I want a trial lawyer. My job is to get you off. And I knew I could talk well enough to get anybody off. But what if they were guilty? And I have what my church people call discernment. So you can lie if you want to, but I already know that you're lying. And so I was going to know whether they were guilty or not. And I couldn't live with it. I thought I would, you know, maybe I'll just get over this quirk that I have. But God knew better. God knew that I was never going to get over that quirk. And when I was here at UVA third year, I took the LSAT. They give you about 500 points for signing your name. And that's about what I got. And I'm going, well, I rather enjoyed that whole thing. What is going on? And then happened to me what has happened to me over and over in my life. I'm rather opinionated and hard-headed. I'm even that way with God. And when the evidence is before me that I am doing something that God doesn't want me to do, I stop. And I say, well, wait a minute. The, this means that this law thing is not what you have in mind for me. Well, I am really pissed off because you had plenty of time to tell me what you wanted me to do. And it's a little late in the game for you to be making this clear. Where have you been? Mm -hmm. And then I got what is I call the God silence. I don't know if you've ever had that. When you know God is listening, but God isn't talking, you could feel the presence of God, but God's not saying anything. I've since learned that that hovering and that silence means your attitude is really wrong. <laughs> I'm going to need you to correct that before we can go forward. Because whatever I say to you when you're in that mood, you're not going to be able to hear. And so I stayed in that place for several years. And then I saw a woman preacher for the first time, and I went, oh, dang. You did mean it. That's what you want me to do. Well, you better hurry up, and you better make some resources and open some doors, because this is ridiculous. And guess what? the door open. And so now I'm a preacher and I talk about truth and prophetic voices in, among us and I try to hear and then I try to tell folk what I've heard and I try to hear what you've heard and I try to be a way that people who are listening for the voice of God, however you call God, can come together and figure out a way to live. So, um, I was introduced by my uh, polite bio. My more spicy bio reads mm -hmm. something like this. Um, I came here by way of Wheaton College, which was stated. Um, but I also came here by way of Wheaton College as a professor who, in <coughs> December 2015, donned a headscarf, otherwise called a hijab, in a, certain, in a particular religious context, um, that being Islam. Um, in solidarity with my Muslim sisters because about two weeks before um, I wore the headscarf um, as an act of Advent devotion, Reverend, excuse me, Reverend, is he Reverend? Jerry Falwell Jr., whatever the hell he is, he is. down the road. <laughs> He's an attorney, for sure. Um, in chapel at Liberty University, um, in the wake of San Bernardino said, if they, meaning Muslims, walk in here, um, if everybody had one of what I have in my back pocket, gun, we could end those Muslims before they end us. And I said, that's not the world my nephew gets to inherit, or your children, or your children's children, or you. Um, and I say that as a way of saying that, yes, I was at Wheaton College, which was founded as um, an abolitionist institution. The founder was a contemporary of the founder of Oberlin University. Um, but I, my spicy bio says I was the first black woman tenured there in its history, mm -hmm. and that was 2013. Mm -hmm. And I want, and I say that, <laughs> not for applause, because it's appalling. 
and my sister told me I'm too angry in my talks. Sorry. I just raised my voice at you people. I told her I'd be nice. But the point is this, I'm angry. I'm angry about injustice. I'm angry that violence was done in Charlottesville as I sat in Chicago, helpless, seeing tweets that Brother Seth and Brother Cornell and Brother Sekou were scattered and Tracy Blackman wasn't sure of their safety. I wasn't here that day, not because I didn't want to be, because I had, to talk, I had a talk to give that Wednesday in Chicago, and guess what? Charlottesville changed the nature of the conversation. But I'm also here to tell you, I'm a professor not to make people comfortable, but to make people uncomfortable. And here's the uncomfortable fact, Charlottesville. Charlottesville called itself, no offense, Vice Mayor, um, the city of, what was it? Like, resistance. this capital of the resistance. Really? The, ca the capital of the resistance was targeted for a reason. Yes, absolutely. Thomas Jefferson. Sorry, I'm using my hands and getting all animated again. Um, but what I, what I want to say is violence was done here, but violence was done before August 11th and before August 12th, and the white shirts represented the purity of white bodies. And that preceded Donald Trump's election. So let's not point the finger at the 81% of white evangelicals, point them back at Char the white progressives in Charlottesville. So what I want to do here is to unsettle us from the level of comfort that a college town seems to kind of settle upon its people like poppies, you know, like a field of poppies in The Wizard of Oz. Sleep, sleep. I'm here to tell you to wake up because what happened on August 11th and 12th is the tip of the iceberg. And if you don't believe we're on the precipice and the threshold of more violence and destruction, you're still sleeping in the poppies. Thank you. I liked what uh, Laricia said about um, unsettling uh, comfort, and that is something that I want to expand on a bit more. Uh, my parents were activists. I grew up among activists. There was always somebody crashing on the couch that was, had come in from someplace around the world and was uh, um, telling us their account over bowls of lentils. Um, of uh, what was happening in uh, whether it was Uganda or Guatemala or just many different places and so this was part of my um, the, the community within which I grew up and went from there uh, that, that you know that a part of their of our church's uh, ministry was to one another to strengthen one another uh, to be in public spaces and to confront uh, particularly militarism uh, by, you know, in public spaces and through actions. And this has taken various forms in my own life. Uh, I've worked in public policy for a couple of years uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, specifically domestic policy having to do with affordable housing and, and this sort of thing. Uh, I've worked in uh, pastoral ministry also in a, number, a couple of congregations. Um, I've studied, uh, and particularly um, uh, studied the religious heritage of folks of African descent and, and the, what the effects of slavery have been. And that has, uh, I kept bumping into a category in my teaching. Uh, as I was trying to teach about blacks and Latinx folks, uh, I kept bumping into this category of white whiteness, you know. Uh, you know, I'd go on these little excursions for my students, and I was like, well, you have to understand, you know, when the Irish came, they weren't considered white, and they were like, what? And that was a mic drop moment, you know, for them. I mean, just, you know, uh, and so, you know, started kind of developing my teaching more, you know, looking more and more into critical whiteness studies and the intersection of um, the institutions which formed uh, this category now known as white, uh, and particularly religious institutions, religious practices, and that uh, then drew my interest into uh, 
the debates that were going on that, that um, Brother John and Sister Jane uh, were involved in uh, on the Blue Ribbon Commission with the Confederate monuments. Um, so just as, um, I mean, the example of my parents and their uh, radical Christian comrades uh, was to, uh, to, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. You know, that this is a, a part of uh, Christian witness, and, and my parents did this, a great example, uh, at some social and economic cost to themselves uh, and to their friends as well. Um, but this, uh, um, I learned, was an important part of Christian witness, and that it is, it is, it is a public witness. Um, after all, uh, Evangelium, uh, the Evangel, it is, it, is, it is a public pronouncement, it is good news, and it, it is meant to be pronounced. Uh, it's not, not hidden under a bushel, you know, if you've all heard this, you know, um, uh, but rather uh, uh, something that's done publicly. Um, and so, since I'm a professor, I would like to give you all an assignment, uh, if I may. Um, I didn't come here for homework. We got enough city council work. No, 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 everybody's got to do this. Um, raise your hand, everyone. Raise your hand. I want you to do this. Everyone's going to do this, all right. Uh, everyone, please search on Google for Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail and read it and talk about it with at least two of your friends who are sitting on the fence somewhere. Okay, it's an assignment. So this, um, you know, when Reverend Sekou, uh, who was here with us for a month or so this summer, training us, um, preparing us, uh, um, getting us ready for these, these days that came, uh, it, he, he uh, got a little frustrated sometimes. He, he heard a lot of uh, pieties by a lot of religious folks right here in this community, you know, uh, about, you know, kind of quoting Martin Luther King and the fight against racism and the fight against white, white supremacy and, and, you know, just Martin Luther King, you know, favorite person to quote. Um, but these same people did, were discouraging engaging in the tactics of civil disobedience. That is, the same people who quoted King so glowingly uh, di actively discouraged engaging in civil disobedience, you know, as if, as if King's movement could have been accomplished uh, without this. This makes no sense. Again, it's a public pronouncement. This takes public confrontations with the principalities in power, and, and that is what Jesus did, and that is, that is, uh, that, that is who I follow. Um, and this uh, makes it important for me, uh, now speaking as a citizen and an activist, as well as a Christian, to prioritize the streets and to not retreat uh, from public witness, uh, even when we're being borne down upon by uh, um, just the collective, the demons of our collective history, I would say, you know. Um, the uh, admonishment to ignore folks that were coming in to spread their hate, uh, I found uh, stood, was unconscionable to me as a Christian uh, and as a citizen. Although I understood the public safety concerns that, that uh, led uh, the powers that be to say this, I asked the question, what would be the better optics? The last time we were here, I was here, a lot of us were here, there were several hundred Nazis across the street over here. Right, uh, with torches, right, and some very brave students. Some of them are my own students uh, who'd taken these whiteness and religion classes with me. Uh, some of my own students had bravely surrounded uh, the Jefferson statue uh, as a not not so much uh, uh, to defend defend Jefferson. This is in some quarters. This is how it was posed, but uh, in in their telling of it, or some of them, it was to not allow there to be unimpeded sight lines between these torch-wielding Nazis and the symbol, the public symbol of the University of Virginia, indeed of this entire town. I mean, you know, um, would it have been better for if, if they'd ignored them and not shown up? Would, would that have been better? Real, I mean, I'm asking, this, you know, kind of facetiously, rhetorically, but, but also honestly, you know, would that have been better? To not, have, to, to not have any opposition to this. Would it have been better to see the streets of Charlottesville? Just let the Nazis have free reign. Just, just let them come in. Everybody stay home, batten down the hatches. No, no. 
Um, and saying that, I recognize that not everybody can be on the streets, you know, um, you know, for reasons of personal safety, and we all have to, you know, self-care always comes first, you know, for physical safety or, you know, you're caring for people. But it's important, I believe, to prioritize the streets to support those who can be on the streets, who want to be on the streets as part of that public witness. So, you know, there were some church ladies here that were baking casseroles, you know, for activist dinners, you know. There were teenagers working in babysitting collectives to babysit activist kids. Uh, you know, there were a lot of people doing a lot of background work that made it possible to prioritize the streets. So what we saw on the streets in terms of counter-protesters was just actually a tip of the iceberg in terms of the community networks that have been created here over the past, well, year and a half, really. Um, but this uh, giving a, a public witness and having uh, um, not allowing uh, this, this um, infliction uh, you know, of, of hatred to just kind of run rampant and to run unopposed in public uh, is an important, uh, it, it's an important uh, civic duty, I believe, uh, and also uh, for myself, it's, it's part of my Christian commitment as well. Thank you. So that's a great jumping off point. Um, I agree with Laricia that this is the beginning, not the end. I think things will get worse, not better, for the short term, medium term perhaps. This did not start with Trump. Um, and so I think a lot of us are thinking about what are we called to do? And Jelaine anticipated, I think, some of what we might be called to do. But I chose to be in this church on August the 11th, and I chose not to be at Lee Park on August the 12th. I did not want to get into a violent confrontation with neo-Nazis and white supremacists. And ever since August the 12th, I have second-guessed myself. You know, I have felt guilty about not having been there, not putting my body on the line as so many other people do. So I'm just going to open this up to all of you to ask a quest, answer a question that I'm asking, but I think a lot of people in Charlottesville have asked, is that, what are we called on to do because the situation will repeat? We hope not, as Seth said, we hope it won't repeat in the same way. But we will be called upon to act. And so, what are the various forms of solidarity and resistance that one might be called to? So, I, I'd love to answer that. Is, is this on? Can you on? So, there's a few different things in which everyone has to do in their own way. So I wouldn't expect everyone to do what I do because I personally believe that God made me to do this. Like my grandmother told me when I first moved to Virginia in what, 2009, before I left, she's like, we don't have any family there. You don't know anyone there, but you've always been brave. And I know God wants you to go there to do something. And after I heard that, I'm like, oh, I'm good. Let's, let's go do what we're supposed to do. And like personally, I believe that God has molded my life from when I was five up until I was 12 and taking missions trips to going to college to tweeting crazy things to be given and like learning from that, meeting different people in our community to being here. So this is, this is like what I'm supposed to do, right? Everyone has a role in the movement and everyone's role is not in the spotlight. So as uh, Dr. Schmidt was alluding to, there was a lot of back work that took place in order for people to be in the street. So when we're looking for what needs to happen next, and, and when I get very serious and passionate about these topics, it's, well, if you are not going to be in the street, which is okay, are you going to attend the city council meetings or the school board meetings? Are you going to apply pressure to the Albemarle County Board of Supervisors who have not had a person of color on their Board of Supervisors since Mr. Charles Martin in 2003? 
Are we making a fuss about that? Are you finding out what their, what's, what's the data in terms of African American young men and women in our schools who are taking higher level classes in both the city and the county? Do you know the information in regards to minority contracts, how they've been awarded within the city? That number as of May of this year was less than half of 1%. 0.04% of all city contracts have been awarded to minority contractors. You want to know what the number of African American males and females who were taking higher level classes in our schools were? Less than 10%. When you ask what that number is in the county, I'm not going to tell you because I, love, I would love for someone to go and do that research. I would love for someone to say, how do we build an incubator to support minority businesses? Or, if you won't do that part, will you do the difficult thing of when you're sitting around the table and confront systemic racism or oppression when it is asked by family members or friends? When they say off-task or off-handed things, will you confront them? This is the easy part. Coming to this forum is great, I'm glad you're here, but this is easy. None of you have to deal with an individual walking around with a sign saying such and such is a jackass. Right? <laughs> and that's okay. No, no, no. I don't say that because I want to pat on the back. Like, that's okay. That's okay because this is what I was made to do. So it doesn't even make me upset. That's fine. And some of us say, I don't want to put myself in that position to be able to go through that. And that is okay. But will you do the back channel work in order for us to have equity and not equality? Those are two different things, and I continuously hear too many of my allies call on equality when we really need equity. Will you do that? It's a bike. <laughs> Seth and I are natives of Charlottesville, Virginia. And so it's laughable when we hear people say, this is not Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. This is not America. Of course, this is Charlottesville. This is what all Charlottesville's always been. Um, and because that's the case, I made different decisions about the 11th and the 12th. I don't know if you know, Tist, but Charlottesville is very far into yet another gentrification process. Um, Vinegar Hill was the one that I was most impacted by. Before that, it was McKee Road. And now we're going, we're doing this. All this, you see all the housing going up in Charlottesville? It's all for well-off, generally white people. Middle class and poor people in Charlottesville are being pushed out of the city simply because they cannot afford to live where they were born anymore. And as I have at University of Virginia, salaries aren't even good enough or high enough for many of the professors to live here either. Um, what do you do about that? I'm African American, I'm very chocolate as you can see. And I tell people all the time, I'm 62 years old, and I was at a women's, uh, group, women's clergy meeting the other day and we were talking, several of so my sisters were saying, they want a safe place to be. And I almost laughed out loud and I said, oh my gosh, I never anticipate that I'm going to have a safe space. That's not how I operate. I already know it's probably not going to be safe, and I'm rather big mouths, so I'm going to get on your nerves after a time. So even had it been safe, if I were big, if I would just be quiet, by the time I finish giving you my opinion, it's probably not going to be safe. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So my psyche is built around understanding that there's no freaking where in the world where I'm safe. And so what it has done is made me bold. I'm just going to say what I think, dagnabbit. And you just going to have to deal with me. Or not. But you see, all this space, this is my space. I'm taking all of my space. I'm not going to take your space, but I'm taking all of my space. I have a really good mind, and I can think for myself. Thank you very much. And so I heard people say they were ashamed or guilty for not having been on the front line on the 12th. But let me just tell you this. I'm way too chocolate to have been on the front line 
I would have been a lightning rod. I've been living this way all my life. I wouldn't go put myself in that kind of danger on that day because somebody's got to be alive to finish mopping up and cleaning and living when we get through with that. I'm also a stroke survivor and if I had to run, I wasn't going to have to be able to run. After being here on the 11th and going to bed late and getting up at 4 o'clock so that I could be downtown for the sunrise service, I realized that my energy level was such that had I wanted to march and I brought my cane with me, I couldn't. I simply didn't have the energy. So stop being ashamed if you didn't come to the march. You had your reasons. There's plenty enough work to be done. The old, old people say there's plenty of good room in my father's kingdom. There's plenty of work to be done. You do your work. Do your work. I'm going to do my work and if we all will do our work and stop being so freaking greedy, we'll come out on the other end. And may I just say this before I shut up for a minute. I am not the least bit interested in white folk being guilty. We can't do anything with your guilt. Okay. What I am interested in, as Wes has said, is can we begin to understand that we must work for equity? Folk, I, for, it kills me. I don't, if you would just put your hands up and agree with the police, you wouldn't be dead. Are you out of your mind? Let your babies be killed. How are you going to react? And let me tell you this. I've grown, I'm a church mouse. I was brought up in the nonviolent church uh, tradition, but we forgot to tell our babies because we, we really thought that it was going to be okay. They don't know anything about nonviolence. They don't know it. And they're not going to let you kill them and get away with it. And I'll say this one more thing. White folks are so, uh, so afraid that black folk will rise up and kill them in their beds. Is you crazy? Mm. We have had every opportunity. You had us cooking for you, raising the children. <laughs> up in your house. If we were going to do that, we would have done it a long time ago. But we know something about the laws of the universe and that we know that you can't live that way and have any kind of salvation or life. So we're not going to kill you for that. But you keep killing our babies and we may well kill you for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my notes are on my phone. Um, there, I, I want to say, like, um, to segue from that, to say, I think it takes soul work to know where to insert yourself. Yes. Hard soul work. And I'm talking to people of some particular faith or belief. Religion, religio, literally means to re-ligament. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and if religion isn't doing the work of re-ligamenting and bringing the body, the human body and bodies back together, it's failed. It's failed the test of true religion. True religion is caring for the most vulnerable, yeah. period. True religion requires us to have a commitment to welfare because welfare just means well-being. True religion does politics because our bodies do politics, right? Yes. yes. And so true religion, the truth of religio is if we're not religamenting and if we are allowing white Christianity to be white supremacy plus empire, because that's what it is, right? This colonizing impulse, which has a different face than it did under Constantine, yes. Yes. right? It has a different face than it did when the Puritans came. It has a different face than the slave masters who created slave catechisms. What's your greatest pleasure in life? To obey my master and serve him forever. That's effed up. And I carry that historical trauma in my body and in my bones. But the soul work that has been passed down to me says yes. what's required of you is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. 
And that requires imbuing my neighbor. There is no such thing as my enemy, my neighbor, with dignity. Because re-ligamenting, the, the tr I'll tell you the truth of the universe. The truth of the universe is you are created in the likeness and the image of the divine, yes. of the universe. We're of one substance and of one divine being. Whether you're of a particular religion or not, that's the truth of the universe. And so I'm interested in, um, like I said, calling Charlottesville to task. But calling Charlottesville to task is calling our country to task as well. So I'll read you some stuff so I'll stop getting off script that I pre-prepared. Um, the KKK is religious discrimination disguised as religious liberty. Read white Christian supremacy, which is also lodged in white mainline Protestant churches, which is why they remain in the front lines, assuming they're woke because they read all of MLK's works and maybe some of Cornell and Cone, but send their kids to the safe public elementary schools, Venable and maybe Jackson Via, but not the rest because really they still judge in those babies by the color of their skin and the content of their parents' bank accounts. That's how far solidarity goes in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm talking about the babies. So how deep and wide does solidarity extend between you and me? I question that. But I'm here to tell you that the black and brown folk of Charlottesville can fight their own fights. They don't need you, actually. They don't need white people who disrespect their moral and spiritual authority the rest of the time telling them how and when and where and whether to engage. What they need is for you to divest of your privilege, so I'm giving you something to do, and your power just long enough to hear the deep dignity that resounds through their concerns and through their commitments. You need to listen long enough to hear that they embody solidarity better than an army of priests and callers because they live oppression daily with dignity. And they redignify us, and it's not epiphenomenal. And one of the things I think that we need to learn as a community and have yet to learn, um, and, and I'm speaking particularly not to communities of color, um, I think you need to learn how you're racist, and that's the sole work. And stop asking people of color, gay folk, queer folk, um, differently abled folk, to tell you how you're racist, ableist, sexist, misogynist, etc. That's the sole work I'm talking about. That only then can you know where you need to insert yourself into justice movements once you've done the soul work which precedes, precedes inserting yourself into justice movements. Now, I agree with what Jelaine said. I met a woman who said she didn't do anything on the Saturday, August 12th, but you know what she had done? She had organized mental health professionals on her own, of her own accord. No one asked her to be there on August the 12th. She was on the front lines. No one saw her except those who were traumatized and came to her for uh, spiritual and mental succor. So when I think about how we can move forward, because that sounds kind of like bad news, I think one of the things that embodied, like the soul work includes is an ethic of embodied solidarity. And of course, I can't find it in my long um, notes here. But I, one of the things that I would say is, um, I think all of the religions of the world point us to, in terms of that religio, whether they're, you know, codified religions or not, this concept of Ubuntu, I am because you are, and you are because I am, points to interbeing, an ontological unity. The deep questions of the ages of the universe we're still asking, right, which is how to have unity in our diversity. And not to oversimplify what happened in Charlottesville, but a question remains. We can't have an ethic of deep solidarity that moves us into these places where we're willing to risk our body, because I call it embodied solidarity. Because mm -hmm. if you're not willing to die for these things, then, then maybe you haven't done the soul work, right? If you're not willing to risk something for what is right, I question whether you've done the deep soul work that leads our hearts towards justice and our hearts increasingly towards, and our bodies yeah. toward one another. And it doesn't necessarily mean standing out on the front lines, because the front lines are different for all of us, right? But I question if we've done the soul work, and only after we've done the soul work can we talk about what it looks like to risk 
embodiment with the other, to be on the front line. And so I think th those prior questions have to be answered before, which doesn't preclude doing work in the meantime, right? But it also says we have to continually do that deep, rich soul work um, that moves us in those directions. Are you dying to say something? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, wow. <laughs> Unless Jelaine and Seth are dying to say something, I, I do want to open it up because I know a lot of you out there are on. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, Chuck is telling me we can go a little longer than 8 o'clock, and I have no idea what time it is. No, we've got plenty of time. So I'm just going to recognize people, and you can address your questions. Uh, ideally, I suppose, address your questions to anybody or comments to anybody. So I'm looking for hands right here. Can I just ask a quick point of clarification? Sorry, Brandy, keep the mic. Um, understanding the positions of the liberal progressive Christians or of the anti-fascists? <laughs> I mean, I think one thing, my pastoral response to me before the flood comes out is to ask them why they think that's important. I hope in my opening remarks I tease that why I think that's completely insufficient. I think that's a very white response to say you can leave that alone. It's the privilege of white people to believe the lie that you think you can opt out of the inbreaking of violent ideology that seeks to dehumanize so many of our human siblings. And as Brenda said uh, so powerfully, the lives that are being lost, it takes a perspective sh shift. The, th the option, the, the belief in the lie that you can opt out is white people responding on, on the terms of white people saying leave those white men alone, don't give them what they want and everything. But for, and, and I've been accused of inciting violence by liberal white Christians so many times for showing up and trying to block their entrance. I encourage a perspective shift because when you start to see that that violent ideology systemically and directly, bodily and spiritually harms everyone who isn't someone who looks like me, then to stand and confront white supremacy in its many forms is not an act, uh, is not obstructing someone's constitutional rights or anything. It's an act of love. Maybe they have a right to the rally. We have a right to, to block them. And um, so I'm a little fired up about it, but I, I encourage, and encourage seems too soft a word, a perspective shift. I don't know how to get there. For people who want to take the president's bait and start to talk about different groups' tactics and everything, there's so much more to be said about that. The short version is, if you disagree with Antifa so much and their tactics, 
out-organize them and show up in the streets like King did, and we would have had a lot more numbers in that regard. But they were community protectors with different tools than we had, and I'm not going to say anything about, about them. I, I was going to say something about the very selective recall of Jesus and MLK uh, that are mobilized by so many white moderates and white liberals. And, and that's why I gave the assignment of, of you know, reading uh, MLK's uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, always, uh, in any social movement, it's always a small minority of people who are the activists. It's all, it's, and they're always seen as crazy. You know, that's how it is. Um, I, I just saw some polling data from, from uh, the time of, of King, you know, during the civil rights movement and in, in the parlance of the era, you know. Uh, do you approve uh, or, do, you know, do you think that the Negroes' tactics will bring, you know, liberation and all, you know, 60% of white folks disapproved. Another 20% weren't sure. And then there was 20% that said, yeah, that this is you know, generally good. So 20% of white people at the height of MLK's movement, only 20% approved. And only a tiny sliver of those people ever came out and did anything. Came out, you know, marched across the Edmund, Edmund Pettus Bridge or, or, you know, went to the March on Washington or all these iconic things that people love to point to. It was a tiny tiny sliver of people. I mean, it's like Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of people can't change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, you know. Um, so I take comfort in that. Um, I wear uh, their umbrage as a badge of honor, these people, you know. I know I'm right. <laughs> um, no, and, and just one more thing, I mean, about this, you know, this sweet Jesus. I mean, it, this is the same Jesus that threw a whip in the temple. You know, there were a bunch of folks in there selling stuff. They had a monopoly and they were, they were uh, victimizing, you know, they had a monopoly and, and they were victimizing poor pilgrims that were coming in. And he had a righteous anger and he took that whip and he chased them out of there. Well, we're trying to chase these folks out. That's what we're about. I mean, I, I would only add um, to the Jesus comment. Uh, we've like uh, most of American Christianity has domesticated Jesus um, and localized Jesus, not to Palestine but to the cross. Yes. Ergo, redemptive violence is seen as the only option, which goes hand in hand with nationalism and patriotism. And Christianity, qua white supremacy, a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus. And I grew up in a black church that had a picture of that. How effed up is that? Right? And my grandfather was the pastor. I love him. And he wrote a letter. I have a copy of a letter that my grandmother gave me that he wrote. It's not a letter. It's more of a journal reflection about why he was not actively involved in the civil rights movement. Although he had served in World War II to come home to his country to be spat on on the sidewalk. That's the United States. Right? That's redemptive violence but it didn't redeem black folks' bodies once they got back yeah. from World War I or World War II or Vietnam. I had an uncle who fought there too, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is nice people like that get other people killed. Ooh, wow. F nice people. My grandmother might watch this. Hopefully she doesn't know what F means. F nice people. F nice church people. They get people killed, period. Mm. So, the platitudes got to quit. And religious language and moral language are what propel social movements because they're prophetic words. They're words about the truth of the universe. They're not words, they're not love your enemy taken out of context. That only works in a particular context. Righteousness and justice go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Read the prophets. You yeah. can't have one without the other. Without so your the righteous other. words separated from doing justice, your works are dead apart from a righteousness true, but it goes the other way too. Faith without works is dead. Righteousness and justice are not twin categories. They're wedded together. So I question your righteousness if it's not accompanied by acts of just justice and mercy. Mm. Mm. Yeah.
not you. No, yeah, but those who say that. Yeah. Uh, two things. I don't know if you realize it, because we have so much romanticized the ML King years, but Martin got kicked out of the National Baptist USA Inc. They kicked him out. Because this is by this is black folk who kicked him out of his his life, his, his family law association with National Baptist because they say, oh, you're just going too fast. You're going to get us killed. They kicked him out. Progressive Baptist was formed as a way of housing him and people of like mind after that. The other thing is, this is the beauty of the human mind and the human soul. I was a very little bit... We get so used to who we are and our people that we don't think other people have anything of, of value. Um, I, after I graduated from this school, I was in line and this man saw what looked to be, uh, what do you call those really ritzy watches? Rolex. I never own, I'm too pleased to have a Rolex. I'm not gonna spend that kind of money on a Rolex, but it looked like. And this little very pink white man says, why do you have on that watch? And I'm going, who are you? But I say that to say this, I was very, very little when I looked at church and I looked at folk talking about Jesus and, and, and love and equality and I said, you know what, something's wrong. There's a difference between the words that people are saying and how we're living. And, and I didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out the difference. I just had to be paying attention, and I was a very, very, very little girl when I realized that we don't live what we preach. And so, at this point, we've got to the point where folks have commandeered Christianity, and this stuff that we practice in our churches is not Christianity. It is counterfeit. It has nothing to do with love. It has all to do with nationalism. And who can I get to be the, on the bottom because I must be on the top? It has nothing to do with God, Jesus, love, and righteousness. It has everything to do with fear. And whenever we tap into fear, we already know there's going to be a battle because we, when we become afraid, we can't hear what we even could have heard. And we become nonsensical. And we will do things and we'll blame it on Jesus. But truly, Jesus has nothing to do with it. And excuse me, those of you who are not Christian, I don't mean to, to leave you out. Because how you call God is okay with me. But when we look at the context of American history and American religion, we are almost certainly talking about a Christianity which has been co-opted by a bunch of fools. And I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Can I quickly add to your, oh, sure. to your comment? Because I also want to be hopeful. Um, there's, I think also that kind of response for some people comes from a place of being committed to ideals of liberal democracies writ large, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that freedom of um, speech, freedom of assembly, um, in this case have been used as, utilized as euphemisms for people doing violence right. and exacting violence on people's bodies. Right. But I'm also concerned about, because half of us up here teach at university, um, I'm concerned about the free speech um, uh, domain more largely speaking, and I think we need to pay attention to that aspect. Uh, and I think that's yeah. another interjection or insertion point for those conversations. I think that we fail in our response if Charlottesville, and this is happening in liberal communities, maybe amongst some of these same people, comes in the end to be about having a broad zone for free speech and or on the other side, I have had liberal friends saying we should outlaw groups like the KKK. Those are the wrong responses, but so is a tepid kind of tolerance. Um, the only way that we can engage people, um, right, left, in between, extremist, whatever, is to go beyond that kind of tepid tolerance and to engage the dangerous ideas um, while pushing back against them with our bodies. So it takes the 10% of people who ever become active parts 
of a movement like this, but it also takes the people doing other kinds of work in universities, and some of us cross that border between scholar activist, um, and so it takes all of our giftedness, but I, but I also wanted to say as a kind of positive way of moving forward in conversation, maybe there are ways of challenging that even in terms of a policy. It's the wrong policy response, even, right? Those kinds of That's a really good question, because we keep gnawing at it. Um, I want to also say that we're at a, a, a point in history where I see people around me who really, really want to go back to sleep. We want to go back to our sleepy little town. Um, I never lived in it in the first place, so I really don't know what you're talking about. Um, but we're at a point that can, is crucial. We've, we, we can't put it off any longer. We have got to have this conversation. As, a, as communities, as a country, we have got to have this conversation. And the universe has made it such that we are at the point where we can have it. We don't want to have it, we wish we didn't have to, it's very, 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 very uncomfortable. But if we can have this conversation, we can actually have this country. We can actually keep the American dream from dying. We can do that in this moment but we're going to have to commit to being uncomfortable. We have to commit to it. And if we let this moment slide, we've lost it all. If you have a question, don't be timid. I can't see your hands if you don't wave them high. Oh, great. So twice I've heard references to the election and framing it as broader, right, it wasn't a one-off. Uh, and isn't white Christianity responsible for the election? And what do you make of that? Mm. The nine over 80% evangelical support of Donald Trump. So <clears throat> in, in my personal opinion, uh, the answer to that question is both yes and no. So when we think about white Christianity, specifically from an American perspective, this is the same religion that was used to keep individuals like myself and others in bondage. Like it was literally used as a tool for slave masters to tell their slaves that in order for you to get into heaven, you need to be a good slave. You need to allow me to rape you. You need to allow me to beat you. You need to allow me to desecrate you or do any inhumane and completely vile and foul thing to you. And there are a lot of individuals who grew up with that doctrine, both black and white. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep that part in mind. I think sometimes it's easy for people of color, specifically black folks, to say that, well, white people have done X, Y, and Z, so we have the right to be angry, which, yeah, we do. But at the same token, have we bought into the notion that Christianity has allowed us and called for us to be only servants and not those who stand up and speak up for what is right? And if we do do that and we are called detractors or agitators, does that mean that we're wrong? That's the conscious piece that I think my colleagues up here have spoken about and that many African Americans struggle with. So when you add that with the notion of white guilt, all of it's mixed up and it leads us to a place of a standstill, but I believe now more than ever, post-election, post A12, people are willing to say enough is enough. And that, my friends, is something for us to be really happy about. So to truly answer your question, I think there was some good that came out of 45 being elected. Because people, have truly, if it took 45 being elected and it took someone dying and it took this terror to come into our community and throughout the country for people to finally see that this place is messed up mm. and that is what is going to take them or that, that's the act that's going to, to force them to be able to go and tutor some kids or go talk to some people who they normally wouldn't talk to, then for that I'm proud that you're going to actually do something. 
So yeah, I'm, I'm really upset with all of these good Christians, evangel these good Christian folk, evangelicals, thank you, who went out and voted for a man who said some of the most disrespectful things we ever heard anyone say. Who would still stand beside a man who not even two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, but just as of this past weekend, caught those who chose to protest peacefully in the spirit of Dr. King, peacefully, nonviolently, those who choose to protest will call them son of a bees, and they still make excuses for them. This ain't, no, this ain't no 14, 15 year old. This isn't a nine year old. This isn't a 20 year old. This is a 60 some odd year old man. Oh, excuse me, 70 <laughs> year old man who was talking as such, but yet he still said the other day that he believes in a greater God and he has a calling in a Bible that he reads every day that he lives and abides by. And guess what? Some of your friends say, I identify with that part of him. So do you call it out, one, in your anger, here's what you do, or here's the question rather, in your anger and frustration, do you call it out and speak on it, using your privilege as Brother Seth and others have alluded to, do you call it out, but then do you take the next step? Do you go to South First Street or Sixth Street and go and meet some individuals and force yourselves to become somewhat uncomfortable to share your privilege or help provide equity? in education, housing, economics, so forth. Do you then take the next step and say that I will be a real ally when I see my brothers or my neighbors or my sisters being attacked? Those are the more difficult things. So yeah, I want you to be angry, but I want you to do something afterwards. And it's not this grand old thing. It's real, small, concrete, tangible steps that moves us forward. May I say one more thing? I'm sorry. As I, I, I skipped the last question purposely, but I wanted, I wanted to read this. this. This literally will take just a couple of, of moments. When your friends talk about Dr. King, this is the same Dr. King. This is my favorite speech of all time, yeah. which probably will make sense after you finish hearing it. It says, I come here tonight to plead with you. Believe in yourself and believe that you are somebody. I said to a group last night, nobody can do this for us. No document can do this for us. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation can do this for us. No Johnsonian Civil Rights Bill can do this for us. If the Negro is to be free, he must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign with the pen and ink of self-assertive manhood or womanhood, his own Emancipation Proclamation. Don't let anybody take your manhood or womanhood. Be proud of your heritage. Here's the good part. We don't have anything to be ashamed of. Somebody told a lie one day. They couched it in language. They made everything black, ugly, and evil. Look in your dictionaries and see the synonyms of the word black. It's always something degrading and low and sinister. Look at the word white. It's always something pure, high, and clean. Well, I want to get the language right tonight. I want to get the language so right that everyone here will cry out, yes, I'm black, I'm proud of it, I'm black, and I'm beautiful. And I wonder if that is the image of Dr. King, the one who speaks about black pride, loving yourself, loving your heritage, the one who at the duration of that speech also put his fist in the air is that the same image that other individuals have when they say they want us to just all get along? Mm -hmm. Or Dr. King said, be quiet, let's always be nonviolent, let's let them walk on us, let's ignore them, let's do all of these other things that make us seem subservient. This is the same man that said, yes, I'm black and I'm proud of it. I want to get the language right. Do you tell your white friends or your black friends who also may say to you that they agree we should be quiet, that this too is the same individual who they put up on their proverbial Mount Rushmore. That is he. He is me. He is you. He is us. He is here today. We speak. We speak up. We speak loud. We stand tall today. Is that Dr. King? And I shut up. Mm. that I think that we need to be very aware of um, 
for the most part, I think we've become very comfortable saying that it was 80% of evangelical Christians who put uh, Trump in office. But what we're not saying nearly as much or as loudly is that there have to have been some rich white folk who put him in office too, because there had to be the money. It wasn't just, I mean, we're okay. somehow people are okay with saying, well, it's the uneducated white folk who did this. It wasn't just uneducated white folk, it was educated, moneyed white people who put this brother in office. And we better own that, particularly as a university town, particularly as a place, as, as a place which is running headlong with the new gentrification plan. We need to own that, because see, it means something entirely different if poor, fight, dumb white folks elected him than if rich, white, uh, educated white people elected him. I'll leave it at that. I mean, and as the political science, there you are. Um, I, I would also, and someone who studies religion, I would also say that um, if we think back to Faber's Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, mm -hmm. um, and the ways in the United States that Christianity and capitalism, mm -hmm. just like righteousness and justice should be, be yeah. wedded, Christianity and capitalism are wedded. And so I would also like to say perhaps the 81% of white evangelicals are a bit more honest um, about keeping their power um, because they have a stranglehold on the GOP. Mm -hmm. Trump was smart enough to know that. And he's still smart enough to continue pandering to them, even though he can't pronounce Second Corinthians. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important to also, if we're talking about the role of faith in the struggle, and Christianity and white supremacy, and oh my gosh, how can this happen? It happens because um, yeah. the white Christianity in the United States has said, Jesus is our personal trainer, Jesus is our life coach, um, and actually you can have it all, even though that's contrary to the message of the gospel, which is you pour out all for the other, yes. because I am because we are. Um, and the only way we can be re-ligamented together, as Colossians talks about, um, is that we are one body. And so what Christianity United States style, and I say U.S. style, yeah. um, has done is say capitalism is moral, patently moral. Ergo, it's all right to vote for Donald Trump because he will keep us in power economically and keep us in power politically, and that has become more important, perhaps, and than the essence of... Um, the gospel that Jillian so beautifully led with earlier. So. Thank you. I was only going to add that, as I alluded to in my opening remarks, there's so much social equity in the United States that accrues, I mean, capital, to calling oneself a Christian. So the immediate thing I thought of in your question and in the flyer for this event, Christianity and white supremacy, Christianity, white Christianity and white supremacy are kissing cousins in this country, as uh, Laricia just pointed out, though with white supremacy that is a virus infecting our collective national DNA. And if I was making any sense in my opening remarks, our true national religions are those other things, capitalism, militarism, and everything. And so if you add the capital, the equity that comes with calling yourself a Christian in a no-stakes country for calling oneself that, I wonder if, you know, as it was already pointed out, nice people kill. Niceness and politeness are not fruits of the Spirit for those playing Bible Scripture bingo tonight. <laughs> kindness is. <laughs> kindness is. Niceness and politeness aren't. And if one of the ways white people can be paying down their equity, you know, it's funny, all the Trump supporters say, he tells it like it is, he tells it like it is. You're, you're implicating yourself in that then. You're saying, you are saying the true not nice thing, which is that black and brown lives don't matter, that capitalism is king, and that sort of thing. What if those of us who want to believe that the term Christianity can even be reclaimed, I don't know that it can, uh, which is why I started with the whole bit about Jesus was a brown-skinned Palestinian Jew, but what if we started saying that's not Christianity, full stop, all media outlets just kind of talk about it like it's this thing, like it's just this identifier that you can put on your Facebook profile. That's not Christianity. What is it? 
I don't know, but that's not it. I'm reading a different text. And that wouldn't be nice. That wouldn't be polite. I think what we like to do is try to make space for like, well, you don't know how the Spirit's going to move. You don't know how the Spirit's going to move. God, remember, those who claim a, an encounter with the living God are sent to manifest particular transformations. It's there in Exodus. It's there throughout the prophets. And Jesus says, this is it. So you don't just get to say it's whatever you want it to be. I'm not saying you have to do it, saying you can only be call yourself a Christian if this. Jesus says, turn around towards this life-giving way, and not only will you be in the life-giving walk of liberation for those you encounter, that we are one together, that you will liberate yourself. That's salvation. You will know the God heart and the God conscience. But the short answer is basically to just correct anyone who says, do you see this? On what basis are they doing what the spirit of the living God sends people to do under the auspices of the name Christianity? Just strike that term from the record. One more question? Chuck? I have a question that's really, I, I want to hear what you all think about this. Um, remember, Mark Gooms and I were actually at a talk this last, uh, last weekend that one of our old colleagues here, uh, Professor Cooper, Valerie Cooper at Duke, uh, gave, um, in which he, of course, quoted another uh, incredibly powerful and poignant MLK line, which is that the most segregated hour in America is 11 a.m. Yes. on a Sunday morning. And I'm wondering, we, we've talked a lot about the theological um, energies that would go into engaging in these divides and overcoming and trying to encounter one's own racial prejudice and whiteness in this way. Is there some way we could talk, and almost as a bit of advice, especially for the more pastorally minded among you, about what churches could do in this context? Mm. Is there a way that the communities themselves, um, as communities, not as collections of individuals, but as as attempts at, 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 as flawed as they all are, of being the body of Christ, um, or pieces of the body. Um, is there something they could do? Um, and I mean, actually, kind of like at the level of tactics in some way. Yes. yes. Stop talking and go do. Yeah. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday morning, literally, we all know when churches start. So what would it be for a congregation that is majority white to say, this Sunday, and we don't have to make a grand announcement about it, we are going to one of the more traditional black churches and we're just going to go. Or then do that consistently. And by the same token, uh, African-American church, I mean, again, the onus, what I do think more of the onus is, is has to be done um, for white people to, to inter, intersect or intertwine themselves with the minority, but and vice versa for, uh, for First Baptist on West Main for us to go and say, well, you know, this Sunday we're, we're going to St. Paul's and we don't call, we, we, we just show up. That's what we're going to do, right? Like those are, I, I think sometimes we make this over complicated and way more difficult than it is. Intentionality and consistency will get us to places in which we have never seen before. When we said that we're going to have this grandiose idea that we're going to try to lead an effort to move a statue and it made so many people upset it made so, so many other people like oh yeah let's go do that it wasn't something that we it, it took like us a, a long time to do I remember like thinking oh yeah I, I talked to Zach, like yeah I want to do that all right I'm gonna talk to a couple of my colleagues some of them were like oh no and I was just like okay well whether you like it or not this is what we're gonna do we're gonna call for it. and then here's where we are like sometimes we have to just do and then worry about the consequences or what we think may be a consequence later. And let's not be paralyzed by the thought of what may happen. Because while it may be bad, it may actually be really good. I'm taking this out. I'll come to you later. Uh, I just started talking this week. I just started talking this week um, with Sojourners. Uh, uh, First United Methodist Church, Hinton Avenue, 
uh, Methodist Church and New Beginnings, and there's somebody else. What's Liz Forney's church? First prayers about all, all of us going in to do a Holy Week together. And we've, that's never happened in Charlottesville to my knowledge. And it's, it's not a grand thing, but it's a grand thing. Do you want to say uh, all I was going to say about what Wes was saying, speaking for progressive white people, we love to talk about having the right theories and ideas and everything and just do it is, I think, really the way to go. Um, and then Chuck, to your question, Dr. Matthews, <laughs> um, I may have lost it. Where to go? Mm. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. What more is there to say? I, like erased everything else. Um, it'll come back to me. So I want to also say I'm not sure segregated Sundays. I think segregated Sundays is a symptom of the problem. It's not the problem. And I think the problem goes much deeper than moving toward the racial other in worship. Because actually, more pressing for many of you would go to Open Mosque Day um, on Pine Street on October the 14th? Or what would you do if Muslims came into your congregation? Or I, I just didn't have the strength after teaching on Thursday to go to the Rosh Hashanah Mabatova um, service, but I watched one online, live streaming, because I've never done that. But I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm saying, you know, my aspirational self is always better than my self self. Um, I think that's one way. Um, but I'm not sure it's either the most effective way. In fact, what studies tend to show um, is on trips and other kinds of these, it reinforces kind of pre existing biases. Um, why did he, why did he start, um, uh, Vice Mayor Bellamy, start giving shout outs to everyone he knew? Mm. That's what happens in the black church. Mm -hmm. You honor dignitaries. To some of you, that's wasting time. But what he did comes from, maybe he doesn't know that, it comes from a cultural space, probably he does. But that's, but that's <laughs> what we do. Exactly. It's called honorifics. Mm -hmm. We call each other brother and sister in the black church too because we honor the human family. So you know what's controversial about me wearing a hijab? I called Muslims my brothers and sisters. I dared to call them my human family mm -hmm. and to evince human solidarity first, religious solidarity second. Yes. There was an order to my Facebook post that got me in trouble. So there's something deeper than the segregated Sunday that we need to address. That's the difficult soul work that I was talking about. Um, but in terms of thinking how then to utilize the church, I would say also, when I talked earlier about moral and spiritual authority, it's below, it's not at the top. When I talked about divesting of your power and privilege, I mean your teachers need to be the most unexpected people. So if you go to a black church, Go at unexpected times. Go on Wednesday night when grannies like my 86-year-old grandmother pray on their knees. Do you know why America is still holding together? Cause Not because of the American dream. It's because your yeah. granny of whatever faith That's right. prays. And so that wisdom and authority from below is what we need to submit ourselves to, what I seek to submit myself to every time I travel in the world, especially um, the developing world, mm -hmm. it's more developed than we are. I've got yeah. news for you. Seriously. In terms of spiritual and moral authority. And a statistic I'll throw at you, the people who give the highest percentage of their income to their churches and to philanthropy are the poorest people in this country. Right. They're the poorest. And they're also the ones who, you can't adopt a black kid. You can barely get a black kid out of foster care. You know why? Because the black community takes care of them. That's our model. So who we see and, and those who we consider our sources of authority have to change because there's a lot of moral authority, but we're getting our moral authority from the wrong places and the wrong spaces and the wrong people. And so, yeah, visiting a church is a good thing, that's or a mosque or a synagogue, but perhaps better would be 
to pinpoint those sources and those voices of moral authority within those spaces and to submit yourselves to their teaching and their leading. Mm -hmm. May I say something really quickly? We need to honor each other's traditions. For instance, 99.9999999% of black Baptists are in Bible study prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. The only reason I am here is because I have a co-pastor and an associate who would take the class. I wouldn't go counsel my Bible study for y'all. So if you want more of us, you got to figure out, think about when you, when you, when you schedule stuff. I'm not going to miss my Bible study, by and large, to come here and talk to y'all. Not most black, most black Baptists aren't going to do that. So if you want me, you got to ask me what time works better to me. This doesn't work for me generally. I'm just saying. <laughs> so I remembered, and Jelaine, I want you to have the last word. Soul work is what we need to do. What was most disheartening to me personally this summer in long conversations, whether over email or Facebook or in person with fellow white male pastors about what I considered the importance of what was coming August 11th and 12th, and we knew what was coming, we knew, was the, there was a diverse array of excuses or reasons or pushbacks, but the underlying theme was, I don't know where I'm at yet on all of this. I'm figuring it out. I think I'm a king guy. I, I don't know. I don't know. And if these are the leaders of the churches in this town and have not done the soul work to locate themselves and who were themselves supremely upset that number 45 was elected and who has summarily put zero light between himself and those who marched on Charlottesville and are going to continue to do so, and we're given an opportunity, a responsibility, not a guilt trip, right? White guilt is the stuck place. Then how are our congregations going to be able to do the soul work? And so someone joked to me this summer, maybe it was Rev Seku, you know, and I'm not really a Paul guy at all, no offense. Because um, we're in sample. But none of the churches Paul was writing to exist anymore. So maybe I'm gonna take it that much further and say, let's ask ourselves, are we having the hard conversations since this is the Christianity and white supremacy in America forum that differentiate ourselves? Shameless plug, the United Church of Christ, of which I'm an ordained minister, has a resource that is not exclusive to the United Church of Christ called literally, let's talk white privilege curriculum. So for those of you who were here August 11th and heard Reverend Tracy Blackman just burn it down, and it's available online if you want to see it. I go back to it time and again to remind myself why I'm still standing. She was one of the primary authors of it, and it's a curriculum. So something really practical, churches can go through this and have those hard conversations and do that soul work together. And because we need to locate ourselves, I... Maybe that was a true excuse, maybe it wasn't, but uh, I think life-giving things will happen when they can, especially when we kind of cross-pollinate on our holy days. No, I think we should thank our speakers.